All right. And so our uh, next uh, presenters are Catherine Brown and Travis Stinton, and I will let uh, David introduce you. Uh, hi, Kat, and hi, Travis. Thank you so much uh, for being here today. Um, Kat Brown is a distinguished professor at the University of Texas, San Antonio, and Travis Stanton is uh, the chair of the Department of Anthropology, I believe still at uh, Riverside, California. Uh, they are both uh, long-term collaborators of, with each other and uh, with me, and I'm honored to have them here today. Thank you. All right, you, you can you can unmute yourselves now, and uh, uh, you can share your screen, and the floor is yours, uh, Kat and Travis. Thank you so much. All right, hold on one second. Let me get this. Um, all right, is that? Can everybody see that? Looks great. Okay, wonderful. Um, okay, thank you so much, David, for uh, that introduction. Um, I want to begin by thanking Matt and Max for organizing and hosting the 2022 Maya at the Lago Symposium, and I wish I could have been there face to face. Uh, I also want to applaud uh, you both for the new Mayanist journal, and I look forward to um, contributing in some way, uh, either as a, with an article or serving as a reviewer. Um, you know, today, uh, I just want to say it's truly a privilege and an honor to be part of a symposium that is celebrating David Friedel. Um, As one of his students, uh, and there are many, uh, David has probably more PhD students out there in the world uh, than anyone. Um, but as one of his students, I'm deeply touched by all the support that and love that he has provided me over the years, as well as to all of his students. David is a mentor like no other. He tirelessly works to support his students, and I feel um, most fortunate to be part of his lineage. As I watched his truly amazing keynote talk last night and how he was able to weave together a rich tapestry of empirical data, ideas, and concepts that translated into the basic fabric of ancient Maya society, ideology, and cosmology, I was again humbled by his incredible knowledge and insight. It took me back to the time when I was a new PhD student in 1990, 1996, sitting in his office, listening to him talk about turtles, inline triads, mirrors. And at that time, I remember thinking to myself, oh no, I'm way, this, I'm, this is way over my head and I need to read, read, read. Um, but David is very patient with his students. He is, the, is truly the master scholar sharing his knowledge. And metaphorically to me, and I'm sure as with all of his other students, he is our first father. And I just wanted to make sure I said that. Uh, I wanna thank him today for all that he has done for my studies and for all of his students. So um, Travis and I talked about what we were going to talk about in this presentation today, and we've uh, collaborated, as uh, uh, David has mentioned, on a number of different projects, including warfare, e-groups, and ball courts, um, and now we've been talking about themes of mountains, the sea, caves, and the trees. We titled our talk Centering the World um, with these concepts, and I think that what we really both want to emphasize today is that centering portion of uh, this particular title. And while uh, Mayanists have long recognized iconography related to mountains, caves, trees, and um, the sea, it was David Friedel and Linda Sheely who brought these concepts together to understand the sacred geography and cosmology of uh, the ancient Maya. At Cerro Maya, David's analysis of structure 5C second showed uh, how these abstract concepts were materialized and communicated in a particular place and at a particular time. 
Furthermore, he argued that 5C second and the rituals that occurred at this special location were essential to the establishment of divine kingship, divine kingship at the site. And as he um, uh, walked us through the jewels, the jade diadems and the crowns and the white um, paper uh, through his talk last night, it really struck me that um, all of his ideas have been um, um, in, enduring and they, we are all finding these same patterns that he first documented and recognized. So today, Traps and I build upon these conceptual themes of mountains, water, caves, and world trees in our own research programs in the Belize River Valley and at um, the Maya site of Yashuna. Our research shows that these concepts are expressed in sacred landscape in both built and natural features and were organized around a conceptual center. And our comparison today, we hope, uh, will show that these ideas were, um, ex were, were expressed differently in these different locations, but the basic conceptual themes were shared more broadly across the pre-classic Maya world. And this to us really um, uh, illustrates a deeply rooted ideology that was essential for the development of early institutions of rulership. So after David's uh, keynote uh, talk last night, uh, Jim Garber, my phone rings and Jim Garber calls me and both of us were really just more or less blown away. And we talked about how David really is the master of um, being able to recognize these patterns, weave them together in a co coherent fashion, and then make us all realize, you know, that we're finding some of these things too. And I, I, I started thinking about my research over the past um, cartoon and a half uh, years and realizing that uh, I really have been following in the footsteps of David Friedel, uh, maybe not intentionally all the time, but lots of the things that I've been um, been researching were all inspired by his work. Um, and following in those footsteps, I'm going to say those are really big shoes to fill. Um, so I want to just go back in time a little bit and touch briefly upon uh, some research with Jim Garber at the site of Black Minetti, as this was really sort of the first place um, that I became interested in mountains, caves, sea, the sea, and the world tree, because in one particular building, Structure B1, all of those conceptual concepts came together in our excavations. Uh, and it was through conversations with Jim and with David uh, that we were able to together sort of figure these uh, themes out. So if you're unfamiliar with Blackman Eddy, the site uh, is located in the Belize River Valley on a hilltop and the northernmost structure of the pyramidal structure at the site was bulldozed in half in the early 1980s. Uh, so um, Jim Garber is the project director uh, set out to um, uh, record the profile, and you can see that profile here, uh, and then we set out to excavate in a horizontal fashion the remainder of the structure so that we could document each particular construction phase. And there were 13 different construction phases, um, uh, 11 of those dating to the uh, pre-classic period, uh, one dating to the early classic period and one dating to the terminal classic, uh, terminal late classic. So um, if you look at this image here, one of the earliest public structures at the, um, at the site uh, was structure B1 fifth, and it's an inline triadic architectural complex. And um, as David talked about in his keynote, that inline triad reflects uh, the turtle back or the belt of Orion. And um, being able to sort of symbolize that uh, particular location. We also encountered a a platform that had masks on it dating to the middle pre-classic period, and then a series of other structures that, that really documented this platform to pyramid developmental sequence. But um, one of the 
you know, uh, things that we found that I think is really interesting to think about uh, is uh, this giant post here. You can see this large uh, hole in our excavations. Um, and that, that, that particular hole in the excavations went through almost all the construction phases, except for the two last, uh, the, actually the final construction phase. And we didn't know what to think of it at first, we had all sorts of ideas about this. And then we went back to um, um, David and Jim's work at uh, uh, 5C Second and realized this was an actual large a meter in diameter post hole. Uh, and we believe this symbolized the world tree, the erection of the world tree, just as uh, David and Jim and, and their team at Saros found with 5C second. This is the um, uh, late pre-classic uh, version of uh, this, this structure of structure B1 and the mask that David Friedel talked about last night uh, with the head uh, emerging uh, from this bowl. And I'm not gonna go into too much detail about this because I know that uh, Jim is going to present on this. Uh, the post hole would have been located uh, right here behind this uh, stair. And I want to just uh, pop in 5C seconds from um, Saramaya here so you can see the location of the post that were interpreted as the world tree. The location of this particular post we think may have been um, interesting because there might have been a post further back um, or it was a single post, but we do believe that this might have represented the world tree, but also scaffolding um, where uh, the um, king may have been crowned like we see in the San Bartolo murals. So moving on to um, my current research project in the upper Belize River Valley, really the Mopan uh, River Valley, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the uh, questions that I've been trying to answer in this this new location. Um, being inspired by uh, um, a working group headed by David Friedel at the Santa Fe Institute. Um, I feel so fortunate to be part of this working group. Uh, we come together almost annually uh, and David is our, our leader and um, we're working actually on our third edited volume. But out of this working group, um, uh, a wonderful edited volume on um, ancient Maya e-groups emerged and uh, I'm, I'm so fortunate to have been part of this. So some of the questions that I'm interested in an answering is how were lowland Maya communities integrated into the pre-classic and how were these uh, concepts of mountains, caves, water, and trees replicated or incorporated into these early communities? And I'm going to be looking at this on three scales, um, focal nodes of early communities, these e-groups, uh, that's the smallest scale, um, and then a little broader, demarcating the community via hilltop shrines, which I'm suggesting replicates or is, is symbolically representing mountains, um, where rituals and processions traced out a sacred landscape and likely the immediate boundary around those communities. And then um, on an even broader scale of how these uh, early communities were integrated um, uh, with each other via networks of e-groups, these e-groups um, being connected in some way across the, the larger landscape. Okay, so e-groups as early focal nodes in the Belize River Valley. Today I'm going to talk about um, this e-group at Las Arenas de Arenal, um, the e-group at Early Chinantanich, and I'm going to just briefly talk about um, the, the e-group at the um, smaller center of Holler Creek. So here's a um, 
a, a LIDAR image and a map of early Shannon Taniche. And um, right at the center of this is a middle preclassic E group. The Eastern um, uh, structure in itself is carved out of bedrock. And we've got the Western structure. Interestingly uh, enough, with this particular E group, um, a second E group was built and structure E2 um, served as both the Western structure for the earlier E group, but also the Eastern structure for a slightly later middle pre-classic E group as well. And I do want to draw your attention to the slope here on this uh, plaza, um, because I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the function of that slope and uh, water symbolism uh, associated with the plaza itself. OK, here's Las Arenas de Arenal, the LIDAR with the site uh, map um, superimposed. And right here at the center of the community, the center of the site itself is this early E group. And this E group um, is uh, the earliest phase of this E group is middle preclassic. And we do have it um, uh, late preclassic uh, and a terminal classic construction phase and, and possibly even several middle preclassic phases. OK, so focal nodes of these early centers, what I'm really arguing is that these E groups are the focal nodes. They are the uh, first monumental public architectural complexes. They were established for rituals associated with seasonal cycles and maize agriculture. And I think what we're seeing embedded in these locations is uh, water symbolism, uh, mountain symbolism, uh, tree symbolism. Um, uh, Francisco Estrada Belli has an, um, has documented uh, a larger post, three of them in front of the eastern structure of the E group at Seval, uh, which he has argued as um, you know rep representing the three stone hearth as well as the world tree. So I think that's um, really important, and that these were loci where the surrounding populations would gather for rituals through which um, local communities were created and founded in shared religious experience. And e this emerging in the middle pre-classic, uh, early middle pre-classic agricultural life way. So I'm, I'm briefly, I feel like I've presented a lot on early Shenantanich. So we've been doing more recent work at Las Arenas de Arenal. And so I would like to talk a, about a little bit about what we're finding in the plaza uh, at this location. And really, uh, I've been focusing a lot of my excavations on plazas because those are the places where in these focal nodes where the ritual activities are occurring. So our, our investigations uh, immediately uncovered a series of post holes on center line. Um, we think that uh, these post holes represent um, uh, the remains of per a perishable altar. You can see in the right here in this uh, image, there are a number of other posts. Uh, and some of these posts, and I, the ones that are directly on center line of the structure, have jade offerings in them, and they're 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 not highly polished, um, beautiful uh, jade celts like we see in other e-group complexes, but they are jade pieces. And, um, and you know, um, thinking about how, uh, you know, Carl Taube and his work, I believe these are symbolizing uh, corn kernels that are being planted. So here we've got rituals associated with agriculture. Um, and I think it's important to kind of think about that these plazas are also symbolic of watery places. I'll talk a little bit about that in just a second. Um, we also have a series of middle and late preclassic burials in the plaza, um, and these indicate evidence for ancestor veneration, specifically re-entry and removal of certain uh, skeletal um, um, elements, including the skull. And on the uh, on this particular uh, burial right here, this individual's burial was re-entered, the skull was removed uh, and placed in a bowl and then put back uh, because uh, the, the bowl is 
uh, above the level of where the um, the rest of the, the vertebrae is. So we know it was moved and then put back. Uh, so I think this is very interesting. And, and we've got a series of uh, three um, in, in, in this plaza alone where we're seeing these types of ancestor venerative practices. Um, and we also have a similar case at early Shenantanich and Cynthia Robin also uh, excavated a, in the center of her e-group uh, uh, middle pre-classic individual uh, that was re-entered and the skull was removed. So this is a broader pattern that we're seeing. These um, post holes in uh, um, the in front of these early eastern structures of e-groups in in the Mopan River Valley, I believe, uh, reflect altars. Uh, that are erected and then taken down and then re-erected uh, for ceremonial purposes. I want to draw your attention to this isometric because we have um, this paved ramp here that we excavated um, and it is a huge paved ramp um, and uh, not a staircase but a paved ramp and it, uh, I think this facilitates processions and movement through the plaza of this particular early um, e group, but I also think that it um, it functions as a way to move water during the rainy season. And I, as I was working in the rainy season, um, we were excavating down here, and we had the ramps exposed, and the water just came rushing down and fully encircled the eastern structure of that e group. And I witnessed it, and um, you know that made me think. Wow, I think the Maya um, created this intentionally uh, to symbolically um, uh, reflect water, but uh, to have the eastern structure of that E group emerging out of that water. So you've got the water, the sea, and the mountain replicated in, in the, the built environment here. Here are those post holes. Here are the post holes from Arnal. They're in the same exact location. So we're seeing it at two sites at this particular time. And, and this is what we think that is happening is a small perishable altar being erected and taken down. This is a plan, I mean, a profile of the plaza excavations from Las Reinas de Arnal uh, and the structure that this uh, Ex structure um, excavations were by uh, conducted by Joe Ball and Jennifer Tashit, and we've been working here. This year, we're planning to go further into the structure, but we have uh, encountered the um, three burials, like I mentioned, uh, with um, evidence for ancestor veneration. But overlying this whole area. Uh, 49 square meters that we excavated in um, the plaza area on the eastern half is a huge deposit of um, lithic flakes, similar to what you see later overlying um, burials and, uh, you know, royal burials and tombs in the, in the classic period. But we in, mixed in with this, we've got marine shell beads tens of thousands of hute, and this is all middle pre-classic, and it is a thick layer, um, obviously constructed to symbolically rep represent um, the underworld and um, the, the watery underworld in particular. So we have that, again, the eastern side of this e-group complex is associated with water and water symbolism. These are just some of the shell objects and lithic that we found associated with that in, um, deposits everywhere across the entire um, eastern half of the um, of the plaza. So hilltop shrines and sacred landscapes, including caves, and I want to mention caves because um, just a, uh, I think Travis will follow up on this. Um, that they were important in the past, they're still important today. These are places where um, uh, modern Maya ritual activities are occurring. And so building out slightly to that next scale from the, um, uh, you know, the focal node of the E-group, um, 
demarcating the community through hilltop shrines and sort of inscribing a sacred landscape. And so um, the evidence that um, I've been able to see um, in my team is that during the Middle Pre-Classic, there appears to be shrines that were established on hilltops surrounding the uh, E-groups at early Shenantanich and Arnal. Um, and evidence from Shenantanich suggests that um, at least the evidence that we're seeing from the Western and the Eastern side is that these were places for ritual mesas, burials, um, as well as other types of offerings, and uh, suggest to us um, periodic uh, ritual activity that likely corresponded with ritual circuits. And, um, you know, on a broader scale, I think these are our places, these hilltop shrines and this ritual um, procession that is associated with the hilltop shrines serve to anchor that center, center that e-group um, and um, make it really the focus of a, uh, of a cosmogram of the, of the community's axis, it becomes the community's axis mundi. So here's um, early Shenantanich right here, um, LIDAR, and uh, classic Shenantanich. And I do want to say, and I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, our, you know, more LIDAR. I'm bringing in a lot of LIDAR here. I think LIDAR is the tool, uh, at least in my case, for ordinary archaeologists to get a little glimpse of Fridella vision. Um, because Fridell has been able to see through the forest for a long time, and um, an ordinary archaeologist might by my, like myself is not. But LIDAR is giving me a little bit of a glimpse of what um, the vision that David Fridell has had all these years, and I think it's a, it's a very helpful tool. So um, early Shenantanich right here this is that early e group um and uh, I, I'm on the axial alignment of the eastern bedrock structure um we have a hilltop over here and my uh former um uh, graduate student Whit whitney Lytle excavated for her dissertation uh, this area and encountered a pre-classic platform or altar feature, as well as um, um, there's this Choltoon here with a star that was excavated by the SHAP, uh, Shenantanich Archaeological Project, uh, Jennifer Braswell in particular in the 1990s. So combining all of this evidence, we're starting to see some real interesting things happening on this west side. Here's just a close up. You can see that Choltoon in the, the LIDAR. Um, the excavations of the Choltoon encountered five human um, burials. And um, I just want to talk about three in particular that I think are very um, unique um, or interesting. There were two that were placed overlapping each other and they were interred at the exact same time. Um, and there, the one was placed uh, uh, head to the east face up. The other was placed head to the west, face down, overlapping like this. Their legs were overlapping. And they were both male, and they were both decorated with turtle shell pectorals. Um, and um, what's, uh, Carolyn Frywall uh, uh, did the Strontium analysis of these burials and determined that they were non-local signatures. They were um, not from Shenantanich. So very interesting. Right next to these two burials was a seated burial. Um, and so I think what we're seeing here in this Choltoon, which I believe is a constructed cave uh, because it doesn't appear to have functioned as a Choltoon per se, but I think it was in construct made as a constructive cave um, is a sacrificial tableau representing um, the rise of the maze god. Um, and I'm happy to talk a little bit more about this. This is all sort of preliminary, but these are some of uh, my ideas on this. Um, and interestingly enough, these burials all date to the late pre-classic. We dated them recently. They were first in originally interpreted to be late classic, but AMS dates came back, they're all uh, late pre-classic. 
So um, here's the early E group, the Western Hilltop Shrine. And then if you if we draw the line all the way through on the same axial alignment, it terminates at uh, an Eastern Hilltop uh, Shrine. Um, my former PhD student, Dr. Victoria Ingalls, excavated the, this um, plaza area or this courtyard area and encountered a series of uh, post holes two sizes, um, small sizes, about 10 centimeters and some even smaller than that. Um, and then um, larger ones that were about uh, 40 centimeters in diameter. Uh, interesting, they did not cluster really, uh, the smaller ones clustered uh, more in a pattern, the larger ones did not. And so um, we have um, uh, been interpreting this as the erection of large posts to symbolize the world tree. Uh, and thinking about uh, the San Bartolo murals and the sacrifices in the uh, you know in the in the four directions with the world tree um, and here's a, a little altar with the sacrifice which we think might be what we're seeing with the smaller post holes and the larger ones are the post and so what we think here is that we have the material uh, correlates of the actual um, rituals that are being displayed on the San Bartolo mural so. Um, and like I said, here's a, uh, a, a little bit of Fridella vision with this LIDAR. We have the Western uh, Hilltop Shrine, the Eastern Hilltop Shrine. And then if we go directly north from the Eastern structure on the axial alignment, it terminates at Octun Khan South's triadic complex, uh, which we think might be somehow related to this uh, ritual circuit. And then to the e uh, South, there is a, a, a structure here um, and it's in somebody's backyard and we haven't tested it at this point in time. So, but what I think we have here is sort of a broader ritual circuit around that early centering focal e group, that focal node. Uh, and here's just sort of a landscape view of that. So let's look at Las Arenas de Arenal, um, because we saw this pattern, pattern at early Shenantan age. I thought, well, let's see if it's replicated anywhere else. And so working at the uh, Las Arenas de Arenal um, E group, uh, I started thinking, well, do we have hilltop shrines around this location? And um, if you, here's the Eastern axial alignment of uh, the Eastern complex. And um, if you were to draw a line straight through that axial alignment, it terminates at this hilltop with this platform on top. This is um, pretty amazing to me because it's just right there. But let's go beyond that and see what we have in the West. And guess what? Another one of these platforms located directly to the West. And if you go to the North, um, slightly offset here, there is another platform. And then to the South, there is a platform as well. And so I think what we have is the same sort of hilltop shrine ritual circuit around the early E group at uh, Arnal that we've been able to document at early Shenantan age. We have plans to excavate uh, this hilltop uh, this summer. So looking at this, um, and, and with LIDAR and kind of thinking about uh, mountains and uh, centering uh, and watery places and world trees, it's all being replicated at sort of a, a, a larger community level here. Here is the, uh, the Axis Mundi is that central, I mean, is the Eastern structure of those E groups. So, um, that was all really interesting and some very fun things that is going to provide years of work for us on our uh, project. But um, we began to think about how these different e groups might be integrated uh, across the, the landscape. Uh, and so, looking using LIDAR as a tool 
for Fridella Vision. Um, we looked at r &L, early Chenonton H, and then the smaller center of Collar Creek. And um, what we noticed is that they appeared to be integrated by the axial alignments of their eastern complexes of their E groups, just like the um, shrines are uh, axially, axially aligned to those eastern structures. And this is a 10 kilometer long alignment that I think is really interesting. Um, and it uh, was established um, when these first e-groups were built at each site. And uh, to date, we know that the early Shinantanich was um, early middle preclassic, as well as the R&L e-group. And um, Sarah Kernick did work at Collar Creek and found even Cunil ceramics uh, there. Uh, and so we know there's at least a middle preclassic uh, e-group complex there maybe it's early middle preclassic but to me this is suggestive of an affiliation and an integration that really begins perhaps with the founding of these communities and um that that really sort of blows my mind when i think about it because this was very intentional um so let's look at this landscape uh just to see what this actually looks like so here's early Shinantanich, and it's um, it's sort of a um, uh, hilltop shrine uh, locations. And I apologize, my cat Boots Balam, Smoke Jaguar is wanting to steal the show today and talk to you guys, but we'll ignore him. Um, anyway, so here we've got early Shinantanich, uh, and we have the r and all. And I've got marked out where those hilltop, um, potential hilltop shrines are at r and um, But uh, we were shocked when we drew a line between the two Eastern structures and they line up exactly just uh, to uh, uh, within like a meter of, of it across this landscape, which you can't even see. Uh, there is not, um, you know, a, a visual from one e group to the next. And then we just decided to draw that line north and it terminates at the eastern structure of the e group at Collar Creek. So, um, all of this was really exciting to kind of think about. Um, and to sum up, I want to say that concepts of mountains, water, caves, like we see with the constructed Choltoon, and trees with the erection of these world trees, uh, were integral to establish early communities in the Mopom Valley. Uh, and that um, we, I do think these were integrated at three different scales. Thank you. Thank you, Cat and Cat. Um, now uh, let's uh, hear fr from Travis. If you want to stop uh, sharing your screen, Cat uh, will be able to uh, welcome Travis. Well, hi, everybody. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to probably just skim through a few things. I think I got about 15 minutes and want to keep everything on time. Um, you, can think, you can take 20 minutes, Travis. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Um, and uh, let me know if there's any issues with my PowerPoint, if, you, if you're seeing it, because I've had some computer issues today, so I, I'm hoping it's all going to work out fine. But I, I also... Looking great, looking great. I want to uh, thank the organizers. I want to thank David. Uh, as one of David's uh, students, um, as Kat was saying, that we got uh, a lot of information um, I, from, from David over the years. And uh, sometimes uh, you, you had to just go to the library and try and figure uh, out uh, what it all meant. Um, and uh, my story with David uh, isn't from Saros, it isn't from uh, El Peru, Waka, it's from Yashuna. Um, I was uh, a very green graduate student in 1995 uh, and um, working on David's project at Yashuna. And uh, since that time, um, I have gone back and continued to do uh, field research there. 
Um, but as a graduate student in the 1990s with David uh, working at Yashuna, um, I, I did come across this reference um, in, in some of his work about a particular structure at Yashuna that had been subjected to a, a, a test pit um, and has later been uh, was later excavated by a, in, um, a Mexican government project. Uh, but this this mound that was fondly referred to as the Benediction Mound uh, at Yashuna, and, and David mentioned this. This mound, which, which is a radial structure, so very much like the, the E-group uh, Western structures, um, uh, Kat was talking about E-groups just a little while ago, right in the middle uh, uh, of Yashuna. Um, and I, you know, David references this, uh, this building as a, a place where a center uh, is being built around. And as I was working through my dissertation, looking at the, the pre-classic through the early classic settlement patterns uh, at the site, um, I, I started to think more about the, the, these ideas of centering and, and the, the ideas of centering and, and community organization have been around for a while. Uh, Landa talks about it. Uh, here you can see an image uh, of Coe's ideal uh, shape uh, of a Maya community with the center in the, in the four quarters. Um, and, and, and it's important to think that these are ideal. In the Santa Fe Institute uh, working group that Kat referenced just a little while ago, um, I had the opportunity uh, to work with a, a colleague of mine uh, at UCR here uh, in California, Carl Tauba, uh, and also uh, a student on the project, um, Ryan Collins, who wrote his dissertation uh, on the e-group at Yashuna. Um, uh, it, to think about uh, again, you know, what the the, the centering principles uh, at Yashuna uh, would have been. David references these kind of early on in the in the work at Yashuna, um, and then David and I collaborated uh, with some work coming out of my dissertation. But when I went back to Yashuna, I was really interested in kind of pursuing the, these ideas. Um, and, and what Carl uh, asked me to think about were, was uh, Garcia uh, Zambrano's work um, that has to do with rituals of foundation. Um, and some of the elements uh, Zambrano talks about uh, mainly early colonial period documents uh, throughout Mesoamerica and thinking about how communities are founded uh, spatially and also temporally. Um, and some of the elements that we oftentimes see in, in Mesoamerican centers are there. So there's the central mountain in the water hole in the cave. Um, these have been concepts which have talked about uh, quite a bit in, in Mesoamerican uh, studies. Um, but Zimbrano talks about some other things as well. Um, he talks about measuring community boundaries in the four cardinal directions, uh, talks about processions and maintain not just establishing those boundaries, community boundaries, but maintaining them through ritual activities, including uh, processions. Um, central fires, uh, which is something that uh, we also saw mentioned uh, in the earlier paper uh, by uh, Deborah and Kathy. Um, and, and there are some other things too, the shooting of darts, shouting, things that might not be materially visible to archeologists, but th there, there's this body of literature that, um, that, that we can see um, discusses a, a lot of activities which are important in terms of establishing the center, but also then maintaining that. And so what we're seeing in the image, if I'm just go back real quick here, is the, what's called the Rinconada. Um, this is uh, an image of uh, Platilpatepec, uh, and you can see the, the bounded space here uh, with the cord uh, and the knots uh, around the, in the community. So uh, trying to found the community, but founding it as a bounded place. Um, and procession, uh, this is an image which comes out of uh, Garcia Zambrano's work of the Mapa de San Mateo uh, Ixtlahuacan, um, that, that processions are really important. One of the things I want to point out on this map is that sometimes when you see you know, maps like this, it, the, the, it's not just the cardinal directions in which the, uh, the processions are going out, um, although we think of the Mesoamerican uh, ideal form of a community maybe being in, in the quadripartite form. Um, there, there are uh, potentially several reasons why that form might not be followed at any particular point in time. Another concept that, uh, that in, in working with Carl over the past number of years, uh, that, that became uh, really evident for, for me to, to think about in terms of centering is this idea of boundedness and that the boundedness is 
dividing something. And uh, in, in this uh, paper that's going to be coming out of the second edited volume from the Santa Fe Institute uh, Working Group, um, Carl and I talk about, uh, so building off of some of his work with wild spaces, this dividing area where the processions would go out to, where you would see the kind of the chaotic, dangerous world of the, the monte or the wilds, and then that being contrasted with a more ordered human domesticated space, uh, to say it that way, um, that that's, resides within uh, these, these boundaries. Um, so it's not just that there's a centering going on and a center being constructed, but there's this boundary that goes uh, around it as well. And so uh, my original work with David uh, on, on thinking about centering practices at Yashuna, uh, started off with with looking at this particular structure here in the middle which is is probably terminal preclassic early classic uh, the the reporting of the the ceramics from the structure uh, are, are not that 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 well done and so it, it's hard to kind of see uh, exactly when it dates to um, but it became evident to me in looking at the site um, and with the chronological data that we did have that there were changes and shifts, in how the, the site was organized. Um, and so we had come up in the 2005 article uh, that we published um, with this idea that there's a, an established center and then life happens, politics happen, things happen and the landscape becomes reimagined, still thinking about ordering principles, the, the quadripartite universe, but you're going to see a palimpsest in, in sites like Yashuna, which are occupied from the middle pre-classic through the terminal classic period, you're going to see a palimpsest of interpretations of those ideas. But one area that I was really interested in taking a look at was the early occupation at Yashuna. Um, and David had mentioned uh, at one point in time, really wanting to, to look at the e-group, um, which are e-group assemblages are not that common in the northern lowlands. Um, and it would be likely the, kind of the early part of the site. So if we were going to look for evidence of kind of original centering, we would probably find it there. And so uh, Ryan Collins, who, who excavated the e-group for his dissertation, uh, put in a number of excavations. And just real briefly, because I don't have a whole lot of time, um, one of the things that Ryan found was that the original e-group um, that was much smaller uh, than the e-group that you see on the surface, um, and that the range structure that is found all the way out here during the late pre-classic is not the original range structure. There was a smaller range structure, largely buried, um, that was farther in, in, into the plaza. Um, underneath that Rain structure that dates to the middle pre-classic and probably goes back to pre mamon times. Um, the, uh, there was um, a evidence of a cave underneath that. Um, again, Zambrano and others talk about caves being associated with these kind of centering and foundational rituals. Um, unfortunately, uh, we don't we can't find the entrance to the cave. Um, the, if I just go back uh, real quick, uh, when the road was paved in 2005 uh, to Yashuna from Peace Day, um, there, there was a, an entrance to a cave that was found here and was paved over. And so I don't know if we'll ever be able to see if that uh, would have led uh, to the, um, the chamber, which is underneath the, the e-group here. But there were several uh, holes that went down into what seems to be quite a large space. In the central hole, um, we find a water jar, uh, this Oya, which is a, a prima mom vessel. Um, and I, they, um, it was obvious to us that they, the, the Maya who set the, the e-group up intentionally placed the rain structure over this, this particular space. When I started working on this project with Carl, Carl took a look at this and he said the, the patterns of the holes look like, um, with one exception, uh, which is outside of the excavation, but if we were to maybe open it up, we might find this. It looks like the shape of the Mesoamerican universe with the four kind of cardinal directions plus the three holes in the middle. And he passed me uh, one of his uh, drawings that he had on this. Um, it, it's a, a little bit speculative in, in the sense that we haven't excavated over here yet. Um, but again, the, the water jar, the, it was found in the center hole. And so uh, uh, as we'll uh, 
see um, a, a little bit farther along, uh, the, the, the idea of water, the underworld, and, and E groups uh, is, is replicated at other places. Another thing that was found uh, in the excavations um, were a series of fire altars. Um, so there were 11 floors uh, that we found uh, in, uh, uh, in the plaza itself. And in the original center part of the plaza, so taking into account the, the middle preclassic range structure in the exact center on every single floor, there was a small ring of stones with ash in, in them. Um, and they were one uh, right up on top of another until we got down to bedrock where there was a hole in the ground that had, what had been uh, uh, covered by a intentionally placed stone slab. And then inside were fragmented uh, parts uh, of a, uh, a primum uh, vessel um, and two chert uh, flakes. Um, and so there was an initial deposit there. And then on top of that deposit, the Maya continually placed these fire altars uh, in the center part uh, of the uh, of the plaza, and this is what we think that they might uh, might have looked like. Um, and then, so we we had early dates of a, a foundational public space in the E group at Yashina. And one of the things that I was kind of interested in, again, getting back to the, the utility of lidar. I, is thinking about the, the idea of a central mountain in four quadripartite mountains uh, in, the, uh, in the cardinal directions. And so thinking about the E group uh, uh, Western structure, most likely radial, uh, although it hasn't been excavated, um, and taking a look out uh, and, and measuring from that specific spot, this pyramid out here has not been excavated yet, um, but is 475 meters to the west. The pyramid here uh, in this uh, triadic group was also uh, was subjected to uh, a test pit uh, a number of years ago, um, and there was some early uh, or terminal formative, maybe early classic materials that came up in it. Um, but most likely, uh, this entire Acropolis overlays some earlier structure. But the, there, again, there was a 475 measure, uh, meter measurement from the top of the, the, the Western structure at the E group to the top of this structure right here, which made me think of Garcia Zambrano's idea of, of the measurements away from the center. Um, going north and south from there, 475 meters to the north at least on the LIDAR, we haven't seen anything and we're planning on going out uh, this summer to take a look at this area to see if there might be something like small altars uh, like Kat is reporting um, uh, on the, the mountain, like the mountaintop shrines. But it is 475 meters offset from the principal structure of the North Acropolis of Yashina. In the South, it's a little bit different. 475 meters kind of gets down in here, and maybe, again, there might be an altar down there. The closest structure, there's a, actually a late pre-classic causeway, which comes down here to this very, very small uh, um, group right here, is only 440 meters. But you get the sense that there's this, this measurement going on um, from that area. And the settlement uh, calculations that we get in Yashina, whether they're volume, area, or number of structures, more or less fall fairly well within that range, uh, only going out maybe a, a couple of hundred meters past the limits of those areas, which gets to this idea of potentially having bounded space. And while the site is, uh, is being occupied during the preclassic period, when the, the E group uh, is first built, for example, that a lot of the, the settlement may be within that, those bounds. In the, uh, at the end of the middle preclassic period uh, is when we, we see the, uh, the E group expanded. You get the, uh, uh, the, uh, another uh, range structure, which is farther off. And in the new center of the plaza, the Maya put down a, a floor and they incise a, a, a cross symbol. Uh, they're also kind of representing that kind of central area uh, and marking the center with the, the symbol of the Mesoamerican universe, um, which is very much re resembles in some ways the, the concepts in the famous uh, Cibal cache uh, that Francisco Estrada Belli uh, excavated, where you see carved the carved cross into the, the bedrock 
um, with uh, also the five water jars for the, the four cardinal directions in, in the central axis. And then that, that shape is then replicated with uh, jade salts. And so you, again, you see the earth uh, and, and, and water jars. So there's water association with uh, these kinds of deposits. Um, I know I'm running out of time, so I'm just going to kind of end it um, uh, with this right here so we can get to the, uh, the, the next thing in the program. Um, but I, I do want to point out that one of the things that David uh, did uh, in his work um, with uh, another graduate student in the program at, uh, at SMU, Charles Suler, was excavate a couple of structures here that Charles once thought uh, when he first uh, set out to excavate them that they were going to be domestic structures wound up to be two either late middle pre-classic or early late pre-classic dance platforms that had uh, um, corridors through them in the, that have been interpreted as having the, the shape of the, uh, again, the quadripartite universe, so this con cross. Um, right off to the uh, the side or the back of uh, what is a later late pre-classic Acropolis group. So this Acropolis group out here was not in existence when these uh, platforms were, were placed down. Um, and David has always hypothesized that there's a third platform that might be underneath uh, the Acropolis, but only excavations would uh, be able to uh, show that. But you see this line that goes straight across uh, the, the E group plaza that lines all of these uh, features up, the, the pyramid that we haven't investigated out here, these two uh, uh, dance platforms, um, and then the, the, the plaza itself. In the subsequent period, in the, in the late pre-classic period, you, you get more construction at the E group. And not only do you see the raising of the floor, but there's an actual causeway made out of Saskab that is about 10, 10 to 15 centimeters above the, the floor surface but is also, and you can't really appreciate it in this photo very well, a different color than the surrounding floor. It's actually mixed probably with a concave, like a red uh, uh, earth. Um, and it has this red hue that goes across uh, the plaza. Um, and while I won't go into it in detail because I'm pretty much out of time at this point, what I would suggest is, is that this is the actual road of the sun. Um, in post-classic times, uh, the... I, the, the feathered serpent is considered to, and, and, and even in some communities today, the feathered serpent is considered to be this vehicle or, or, or the road of the sun. And we may be seeing these processions having to do with uh, solar rituals, which e-groups have uh, a, a very strong association with the, the movement of the sun um, that, that, that's being reified uh, in this particular space uh, in, uh, in, uh, uh, at Yashuna in the, uh, the pre-classic period. And so um, we can see here, this is the uh, San Bartolo mural. I've skipped over a few things, but you, you've got the, the mountain symbol. Uh, Carl Tauba has interpreted this as Flower Mountain. And you actually see the feathered serpent come out as breath from the uh, Flower Mountain, which is considered to be a solar paradise. Um, and most likely the, the central mountain um, in, uh, in Mesoamerican thought. And, and individuals, in this case, the maze god and, and, and other supernaturals, standing on top uh, of that, um, not necessarily processing at this point, um, but, uh, but they're on top of this. And one thing I just like to leave everybody, and I was going to say a few other things, I'll leave it at this, is that you see in other examples of e-groups, these Western structures, these radial structures, this is the uh, uh, Proskuryakov's uh, drawing of, uh, uh, of the uh, Western structure at Washak Tomb. This is uh, an image of the Western structure at San Bartolo, the, the buried one underneath the, uh, the Acropolis, that you see in those mountain spaces feathered serpents in both cases descending from the mountains. And I would suggest that this is uh, a uh, question that we need to explore a little bit more, this association with solar movement, solar paradises, and potentially flower mountains uh, that, are, uh, that, that could be associated with, uh, with these groups. But with that, I'll, I'll leave it. And uh, I would just like to, to thank David for everything you've done for me as a student and as a colleague. Um, uh, it's been wonderful to be inspired by you uh, and to work with you throughout my career. Thank you so much, Travis. Here we are with David.
Thank you, Travis. That was wonderful. Thank you, Kat. Uh, thank you both. Uh, it's been a great pleasure and privilege to uh, work with you as colleagues and friends all these years. And I really look forward, Travis, to hearing more about Feathered Serpent soon uh, in uh, the next meeting of the Santa Fe Institute Maya Working Group. We'll keep working on this, but I'm very impressed in both cases with the remarkable effort you are making to uh, to, to show how the Maya uh, define their world and uh, and discern in their world uh, the uh, the living being that it is the cosmograph that it is uh, they don't I'm sure think of it as something they're imposing at all but rather something that they're discovering and harnessing and uh, celebrating uh, coordination with. So now I would like to introduce uh, David. We're going to take the time for one question. One question. I'm sorry. Uh, I would like to open the, uh, maybe ask if there's one here in the audience that has any question for either Kat or Travis, uh, since um, I didn't do that last time. Any questions here? No. Okay. Well, let's see here. Uh, we have uh, Jim Reed, who, uh, okay, no, that little general question here. Uh, 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 Okay, <laughs> the, the, the two questions um, are, so someone is anonymous too. So, okay, so I guess um, we will, we don't have any questions right now that, that really uh, are uh, understandable. I'm sorry, or that, or that apply for, for the, the, the material being covered. Uh, or so is there any, if anyone has a question, you can write it down right now uh, on, the, uh, on the question and answer uh, button, or unless one is, yeah. There's no question on the general chat either. Okay, so I guess that means we're gonna be moving forward. Thank you so much, uh, Kat and Travis. Your, your presentations were so clear that there's no need to ask any questions. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much.